this morning about repatriation of art. Uh, so with that, let me sit down, be quiet, and let Lowell speak to us. So good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is a little different. This is a Rebecca uh, Albiani lecture, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I decided to take it upon myself to talk about a topic that I find to be fascinating and one that's getting a lot of uh, current attention. Uh, if you saw Time Magazine a few weeks ago, you saw a headline that said, uh, American Museums of Nat American Museum of Natural History closes certain displays uh, among new federal regulations. Uh, the New York Times had a similar article. Uh, leading museums remove native displays of new federal rules. American Museum of Natural History is closing two major halls as museums around the nation respond to updated policies from the Biden administration. That's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> uh, I'd be willing to come back and do this one uh, later. Uh, but what I want to talk about today are some uh, kind of uh, classic, classic cases. And I want to develop a little background about this before I go into these two, uh, two examples. Uh, what's the question of art? Uh, and objects uh, in cultural context. And as I say in the first line there, uh, one man's art or one people's material culture is another people's art. And so uh, there are a couple of important terms to, to introduce. Uh, one is the concept of cultural patrimony, uh, and this is defined as the historic and artistic materials created by people as an expression of themselves uh, and thus belonging to them. Uh, and what's important there is that the, the, the context, these are, are, are important in the, the context of the societies that develop them. There's a similar term that's slightly different, that's cultural appropriation. Uh, and this occurs when cultural imagery or uh, materials are root, removed from their cultural context and then used in ways that they were never intended. So a head of a, a ruler of uh, Benin uh, was never intended to be in a glass case uh, in, in the museum, either in Europe or in America. That term, the term culture appropriation, is oftentimes, or more often, used uh, when people of one society uh, take over uh, a behavior or a trait of another. So one example that's sometimes mentioned here is the uh, white, white people having their hair put in cornrows, uh, which is, 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 is a black, and that's considered cultural appropriation. So I want to talk about museums. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a museum guy, uh, and museums, uh, you know, there, there's a few characteristics to, to begin with. Uh, people are hoarders. Now, that's not really true the way, in the sense of people piling up newspapers and magazines uh, in their apartment. And, and really, uh, I think the world is divided into two kinds of people, people who are collectors and non-collectors. It's kind of like the world is divided between cat people and dog people, uh, or miracle whip and mayonnaise people. Uh, some people collect, other people think everything should be put away and surfaces should be clean. Uh, I fall into that first category uh, of being a collector, and, and Susan could about vouch to that. Uh, private collections usually are idiosyncratic. People collect things they find interesting. Uh, if any of you have uh, taken a look at the book, The Boathouse, about Dale Chihuly, you will find that he found a lot of things interesting. Uh, he collected dark accordions. Uh, but most of the time, people collect, you know, kind of a you know, narrow genre. On the other hand, uh, beginning in the, the, the 16th, 15th century, people began to develop what are called cabinets of curiosities. And these particular are usually included things like natural history specimens, stuffed animals, shells, rocks, uh, and then developed into collecting items from other cultures. Uh, such as native wood carvings, uh, uh, statuary, and so on. And there's a long history of this. Uh, 
in a, in a slightly different uh, direction, uh, the palace museums began. And the Louvre is the best example of this, perhaps, where items uh, were brought, put into a, a, a palace or a, a, a building, uh, and Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, managed to uh, enhance the collections of the Louvre uh, by, by stealing things and bringing them back. There are also a number of, of specialized museums, uh, that is, art museums, uh, anthropology museums, and natural history museums, which tend to focus on somewhat narrower uh, ranges of uh, objects. Uh, and there are a lot of examples of those. The museum took on a new role uh, as an educational institution. So rather than being a, a, just a bunch of stuff put in cabinets, museums began to realize that those collections could be used. Uh, and so the most major museums have a major educational function. There's a lot of discussion now uh, in the museum community uh, about the fact that museums uh, perpetuate colonialism and violence. That is, they are populated by things that were taken from people uh, and brought back to wherever the museum is. And th this is a, a very contentious issue. There's a, a very interesting book called The Brutish Museums uh, that focuses on this. It's a takeoff on the term of the British Museum. This guy is a curator uh, in, in one of the universities in England, uh, it makes a very strong case that what we see in museums is a perpetuation uh, of the uh, colonialism. The ethnographic museums, that is ethnographic being the, the, the remnants, the cultural items of a society, uh, are often considered to be a place of intercultural understanding. You go look at a diorama of the Woodlands Indians, and it's supposed to give you an idea of what their lives were like. And the, the role of, in museums of dioramas, that is a reconstruction uh, of, a, of a village or whatever, uh, began uh, and became very important as a way of trying to introduce people to the lives of, of other people. Uh, the, the great encyclopedic or, or world culture museums uh, are ranked primarily on the quality and the variety of their, uh, their collections. Uh, and these would include museums like the British Museum, uh, the Field Museum, uh, the Milwaukee Public Museum where I trained, uh, and the American Museum of Natural History. That is, museums that attempt to represent a broad sweep uh, of the cultures of the world. And the, the reputation of museums tends to grow uh, on the basis of the, how well they represent culture, periods, and nations uh, that are kind of in this broad sense of, of world cultures. So, the problem of looting. Yeah, I knew I'd missed one. Um, so there's a, this is a quote from, I think, from the British Museum book. Uh, there is a reevaluation of presence of what it means to be a museum in the modern world. To many, they are no longer viewed as neutral spaces, guarding or caring for sacred and ancient treasures, but as institutions that are rooted very often in histories of imperialism and therefore have some kind of responsibility become sites of reconciliation and atonement. This is a, this is this different uh, approach uh, that suggests and calls out the history of museums and points out that a number of the collections were collected uh, or items were collected uh, during the expansion of, of imperial powers such as the British Empire, uh, Germany, and so on. This is kind of the crux of the matter, I think, with regard uh, to the uh, issues of repatriation and, and of not only repatriation, but changing in the changes in the display of indigenous people's materials, particularly in the United States. 
as I say, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I'd be willing to come back and talk about the legislation and, and what's being done in that area. So, uh, this is not cooperating. Okay, <laughs> it's all magic. <laughs> they, they just kind of happen. It's, it's a random number generator. <laughs> um, so the, the, the problem of looting. Uh, there is a lot of discussion, particularly in Europe, uh, about uh, the extent of cultural materials uh, that have come into museums and into the art market in general uh, as a result of grave robbing uh, and tomb looting. Uh, there are a number of important examples of this. Uh, again, a, a, an extensive literature. Uh, the Getty Museum uh, in Los Angeles uh, has uh, been the re in the news quite a bit, not so much the last few years, but recently anyhow, uh, of a curator there who ended up in jail uh, because of the purchasing processes. And this again, this is a slightly different story. I think Roberta, Roberta may come and talk about uh, that issue. The spoils of war, I pointed out, uh, that Napoleon took things back, and, and it's quite common uh, for, uh, at, during periods of war, for things to be taken. Uh, and one of the examples today uh, is from a, an invasion in, in the country of Benin. Uh, and then uh, colonialism and the material culture of subjugated peoples. This was, a, this was an important thing uh, where once people uh, were encountered, uh, things would be taken from them. And again, this is one of the, the uh, an example of looting, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about today. There are two terms that are used that uh, sometimes are used interchangeably, uh, but they, they are slightly different. Uh, they, they really have different meanings, particularly from a legal perspective. The first term is restitution, uh, and restitution refers to the act of returning art or cultural treasures to their original owners. Uh, and this, in the context of art, restitution is often used when referring to art that was stolen during times of war. Uh, and a, a good example of this that some of you may be familiar with uh, is the painting by Klimt, the woman in gold, uh, that was taken from a Jewish family during the World, Second World War, uh, made, captured, if you will, taken over by the Austrian government in a museum, uh, and successfully the painting was returned uh, to the, the rightful owners through the legal action. Repatriation, what I want to talk about today, uh, is the act of returning cultural treasures to their country of origin or, or, or culture, country of origin or culture. Uh, so this is really in terms of groups of objects that ne don't necessarily have an identifiable owner, but they represent uh, a, a particular people. Uh, and that could be either uh, an indigenous group uh, or a, a nation. So, uh, museums and repatriation. Uh, over the last few years, return claims by former colonial countries, colonized countries, and indigenous communities for their stolen cultural heritage uh, have reached the general public. In the past, this was things that museum directors and curators dealt with but now uh, this has gone well beyond the bounds of the museum uh, into the, the general public. Uh, this also then suggests the point that I made earlier, that these claims really uh, reveal in turn the inherently violent uh, nature of many museum collections. We don't tend to think about that. You go to a museum and you see something that looks interesting. 
but you don't really know how it was obtained. And many times there are questions of provenance, uh, so that you've got an item that may be of questionable background, uh, and even the museum may not know the provenance. It may have been, uh, you know, kind of just surreptitiously bought, purchased, or, or traded for. So, the, the, there's an issue here of the museumification uh, of cultural heritage objects really uh, inspires a, a Western, or embraces a Western-inspired epistemology uh, of world order. Uh, again, the argument being that this continues uh, to uh, the, the uh, imperial project of, of knowledge, so that this is kind of a, a funny way of saying it, but the, the Western encyclopedic museums uh, have justified holding on to culture artifacts uh, by arguing that they have uh, superior abilities to maintain these artifacts uh, and that they should be shared with the world. Uh, returning objects to their place of origin represents an attempt to restore a lost uh, order disrupted by violence, that is, lost from the diplomatic, political, or, or cultural perspective. Uh, some curators feel uh, the antiquity should be considered a part of a, a shared global heritage rather than the property of a single nation. Kind of this, this idea uh, that everybody, everything we need to understand from the worldwide perspective as opposed to something being uh, of known only uh, to the people who created it. Uh, they also believe that the job of protecting, displaying, and, and loaning them uh, should go to those best placed to handle this responsibility. Uh, and there's a position held by some that the current residents of a nation may not represent their purported ancestors. And this is one of the issues with the repatriation of Native American uh, objects. Do current recognized tribes really represent uh, the, the people who, who created the objects. So the, the two things I'm going to talk about today uh, are ones that get a lot of attention, have gotten a lot of attention, and that's the uh, re return of looted objects, the uh, rise of, due to the rise of nationalism, uh, and this is in Greece, uh, and the second is uh, independence movement, movements in former uh, European colonies in Africa, and that's Benin. So the two examples I'm going to use today, talk about today, uh, are the Elgin marbles uh, in the British Museum, uh, and then uh, a group of objects that are referred to as the Benin bronzes uh, that are held in large part uh, by the British Museum uh, the German Ethnographic Museum in Berlin uh, and other places as well, including the Sale Art Museum, as I'll point out later. <laughs> so the Elgin marbles, lots and lots of controversy, lots of discussion, multiple books. This just shows two books uh, that have been published in the last few years uh, that deal with the collection of the marbles and their uh, suggested return. Uh, it could be argued uh, that the Elgin marbles now are uh, famous less as the art objects and their fantastic art, uh, but really the focus of political controversy. <laughs> controversy between British Museum particularly uh, and the, the Greek <laughs> government. Uh, the tendency now is to no longer refer to them as the Elgin marbles, but rather the Parthenon sculptures uh, or the uh, the Parthenon marbles uh, and the galleries in the British Museum have, have been renamed to reflect that. Uh, as I say, this is a political issue, and so for many people, the Parthenon sculptures uh, provoke only one question that is, should they be in London or should they be in Athens? And the Greek government has said, insists that they should be in Athens. Uh, the British Museum trustees believe in London that they're an integral part of the story of world cultures. That is, they're better viewed in relationship to other sculptures, say Egypt uh, and, and Rome, Roman sculpture, as opposed to being uh, 
this uh, in Greece. So here's a, a reconstruction uh, of the Acropolis Hill, Acropolis Hill in Athens, uh, and the large building at the top uh, is the is a reconstruction of the, the Parthenon. That's what the people think it used to look like. Uh, here's what it looks like now, uh, and uh, the the Parthenon itself uh, is a very large building. It was built as a temple uh, to Athena uh, in the 5th century BCE. Uh, it was built in thanksgiving for the Hellenic victory over the Persian Empire, uh, the invaders from the Persian Empires, uh, Empire during the Greco-Persian Wars. <clears throat> it's considered to be a, an enduring symbol of ancient Greece, uh, democracy, and, and Western civilization. So you've got a single building uh, that embodies all of these these concepts and these ideas. This is this is what it was thought to look like originally. Uh, a, a massive building. If you've been to Greece, you realize that it doesn't look this way now, but it's still uh, a very impressive monument. Uh, the original Parthenon. Uh, was uh, destroyed in the 1600s uh, due to an explosion uh, that it was ignited by Venetian gun and cannon fire. Uh, the Parthenon was used during the autumn times as an arsenal, uh, as a storage place for munitions uh, and a well-placed or several well-placed shots uh, managed to blow it up. Uh, it was destroyed and damaged many pieces uh, of, of Parthenon Ark, including much of that that was later removed uh, by Lord Elgin. So here's a, a drawing showing the Parthenon uh, and the Acropolis Hill being blown up. Uh, you can see that it, it, at one time it was a mosque. You can see the minaret there. It has an interesting history of, of after the, the fall of the Greece, Greek. Uh, civilization. Uh, it was one time used as a church and then during the, the Ottoman rule used as a mosque as well as being uh, used to uh, hold ammunition later. Uh, so here's what the Parthenon looks like now. It doesn't look quite this good, but this is a great, it's a great picture. Right? <laughs> so what are the, 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 the sculptures of the Parthenon? The, the Parthenon sculptures represent uh, a, an Athenian universe that's made up of gods, uh, heroes, and mortals. So it's kind of woven together in a number of complex scenes uh, that are drawn from both myth and daily life. Uh, some people consider these marbles, these sculptures, uh, to be some of the best sculptures ever made in terms of their, their uh, uh, kind of representation of, of the the finer side of art. Uh, many of the figures in the Parthenon were carved by the very famous Greek sculpture Phidias, uh, and the more, most important sculptures are found in three areas, uh, the pediment, uh, the frieze, and then what are called the topes. This is a, a, a drawing uh, of the structure of the Parthenon. Uh, you see at the top the pediment, So here's the pediment up here. The utopias are these squares like this, and then here's the frieze, the frieze in here. So those are the major architectural considerations uh, from an artistic point of view. So I call these the Elgin marbles or Elgin marbles. Who was Lord Elgin? Uh, well, Lord Elgin was really Thomas Bruce. He was the seventh Earl of Elgin, uh, and in 1798, uh, he was appointed as quote unquote ambassador extraordinaire and minister po plenty potentiary <laughs> potentiary of his Britannic Majesty to the sublime port of Selim the Third, Sultan of Turkey. Uh, at this time, uh, Greece was part of the the Ottoman Empire. It was not an independent country. Uh, 
Lord Elgin, when he went to uh, went to Greece, uh, approached officials of the British, or before he went, uh, approached officials of the British government to see if they would be interested in employing artists uh, to take casts and make drawings of the sculptured portions of the Parthenon, but simply they weren't. Uh, so uh, Lord Elgin went uh, and took it upon himself with his own funds uh, to undertake this, uh, these drawings, but he did much more uh, than to undertake the drawings. His, his original intention was to uh, document the Parthenon, document the sculptures, uh, but then in 1801 uh, he began to remove materials remove the sculptures from the Parthenon. Uh, subsequently, uh, he stated that the work of his agents at the Acropolis and the removal of the marbles uh, were authorized by a firman. Uh, that's a, an official edict uh, from the Sultan. Uh, remember I said this was Ottoman, so it was the Ottoman Sultan in, in Constantinople. Uh, and it was undertaken with the approval of the Bodhi, that's the civil governor of Athens, and the Dizdar, uh, who was the military commander of the Acropolis uh, Citadel. Uh, so he, he says that he has permission not only to do drawings, but to remove uh, pieces of the, the Parthenon. Uh, then he got another firman, another uh, permission uh, to ship the pieces from uh, Athens uh, to Britain. Well, <laughs> this is a, a very, 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 very complicated story. Uh, there's a debate whether those documents really uh, allowed the, ar the agents to remove the marbles uh, and the, uh, whether or not this really came from the Sultan or whether it had anything to do other than allowing him uh, to do the drawings and casts and so on. Uh, be that as it may, uh, the marbles were packed in about 200 cases, boxes, uh, sent by wagon uh, to the port of Prius, Prius, which is the port for Athens, uh, then shipped from Greece to Malta, uh, it, which was at that time a British protectorate. Uh, and the marbles remained in Malta for a number of years until they were transported to Britain. Uh, this is very, very simplified but I'm going to stick with it anyhow. <laughs> so, once they got to Britain, some people were really very unhappy about it. And one of those people was Lord Byron, the, the poet. Uh, and in Child Harold's pilgrimage, she has a, a section that says, Dull is the eye that will not weep to see thy walls defaced, thy moldering shrines removed by British hands which it had best behooved to guard these relics ne'er to be restored. Cursed be the hour when from their isle they roved, and once again thy hapless bosom gored, and snatched thy shrinking gods to northern climes and poured. Uh, so there were a couple of other poems, but this is, this is kind of cool. So we've, we've now got the marbles out of Egypt, I mean, sorry, no, that's, that's another story. Uh, we got the marbles out of Greece, they've gotten to Malta, and now they're in, the, in England. Uh, well, how did they end up at the British Museum? Well, originally, Lord Elchin was going to uh, build a museum uh, at his uh, estate, uh, and uh, basically, he got divorced, and his wife took all the money, which is a short story. Uh, so it says here, because of financial difficulties, uh, following his divorce, uh, Elgin sold the marbles to the British government uh, for 35,000 uh, pounds. And he, there's a long period of negotiation to get this price, but it's basically less than half uh, of what he had paid to get them uh, both retrieved from the Acropolis uh, and then on to, on to England. Uh, by an act of parliament uh, in 1816, uh, the British Museum Act, the collection was transferred to the British Museum on two con major conditions. One is that the marbles be kept together, uh, and the second was that they re be named the Elgin Marbles. 
So this is the, we've now gotten the, the marbles uh, out of Greece. We've gotten them to England, and now we're putting them in the British Museum. Uh, and here is a, a painting at the time uh, showing a temporary exhibit, uh, the Algin Room at the British Museum in, in 1819, that is shortly after uh, they were purchased and provided to the museum. Uh, this is one of the old halls uh, in the British Museum. Uh, and you can see just some examples of some of the marbles. Uh, some pediment pieces at the end there, uh, and some pieces of the frieze and the topies along the side. Uh, so what does the British Museum hold? What is it that Greece wants back? Uh, there are 17 pediment figures. Uh, those are gods and mythical figures. There are five metopes, which depict the battle between the centaurs and a mythical tribe of humans called the Lapis. Uh, and there's 247 feet uh, of the original frieze that depicts a procession of the Pan-Athenic Pan festival that celebrated the birthday of uh, Athena. To give you an example of what they look like in situ, uh, these are uh, from the east pediment. Remember the pediment's that top part at the top, and you can see how they slant up uh, in relation to the, the overlying forehead structure. Uh, some more pieces from the east pediment. Uh, these, are, these are huge. They're bigger than life size. Uh, here is an example of one of the topes. This is a centaur uh, fighting a lapith. Uh, and a couple of examples uh, of the from the frieze, uh, but you can see, but just by this, quickly looking at these, the 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 quality of the art. I mean, they're just abs. If you've been, if you've ever seen them, you realize how amazing they are. And so the question is, should they be there or not? Uh, another view of the frieze, and so. Where should they be? Where should the Parthenon marbles be? Should they be in the British Museum, where they've been for 125, 20 some years? Or should they go back to Athens? So, what are, what are the arguments uh, regarding repatriation? And I'm, I'm trying, I'm making this really simple. They, they, they are not simple the arguments. Uh, the Greeks are, the Greek government. Uh, and supporters of the marvelous return to Greece have argued that first the culture, the sculptures uh, were obtained illegally, or if not illegally, at least unethically. Uh, the uh, sculptures are of exceptional cultural importance to Greece, uh, and the cultural value of the sculptures uh, would be best appreciated in a display with other Parthenon antiquities in the Acropolis Museum. At one time, the, the, the British Museum could argue that they didn't have appropriate facilities to care for the marbles uh, in Greece. That's no longer true. There's a new Acropolis Museum that has the, the remaining pieces, and they've in fact left space for these uh, in the museum to be returned so that you've got as complete a reconstruction uh, of the, the sculptures as possible. So, what's the British perspective? Well, the UK government and the British Museum, and these are separate. The British Museum is, is not part of the government. Uh, it's very complicated, but it's, it's a separate entity. Uh, the sculptures were obtained legally. Uh, the return of the sculptures would uh, set a precedent which would undermine collections in the major museums of world culture. And this is, this is really, I think, to me, the driver. You make a decision to send something back, and all of a sudden, everybody wants everything back. Uh, and that's, that's a problem for museums. You know, what, what, it's a slippery slope. You send something big back, then they want the little stuff back. Uh, and then the, the, the third uh, point here, and as I say, this is very, very simplified. Uh, by exhibiting these sculptures in the British Museum, 
it allows them to be seen in context with other world cultures. So that it's part of a, a artistic heritage uh, that allows you to look at these uh, with in, in the context of not only the art of Greece, but the art of Rome, the art of Egypt, the art of Assyria. So that in the large, at the, these large encyclopedic museums, you have this breadth of, of materials. Well, what do I think? <laughs> well, I started by saying I'm a museum guy. I've seen the Parthenon marbles in London probably, I don't know, six or eight times. And I think they're great. But I think they should go back. I think that the argument that can be made uh, is, is, is very strong. And if you asked me that two weeks ago, uh, I probably would have gone on the side of the museums, or the British Museum to keep them. But the more I've looked into it, uh, the more I'm beginning to feel that they really need to go back. So that's number one. That's example number one, the, the Parthenon marbles. Number two, Africa's stolen art, Europe's stolen African art. These are, are master heads from, from Benin. Uh, another uh, headline story, uh, the story of the Benin bronzes and how they ended up in Germany. Uh, and so I want to talk about, uh, begin by talking about Benin, talk about the bronzes in context, and then talk about their, their uh, display uh, in museums basically around the world. Well, the, the kingdom of Benin uh, is located in West Africa. Uh, it was established by the Edo people in the 900s. Uh, the kingdom was ruled by hereditary rulers known as Oba, uh, and the Oba lived in Benin City, large palaces decorated with extensive metalworks. Uh, one of the, the responsibilities of the Oba uh, was to develop and maintain altar shrines to their ancestors. Uh, in 1897, uh, the British basically invaded Benin City, uh, exiled the Oba, took over the kingdom, and established the, this became part of the British colony in Nigeria. There is a Benin now, but it is not the same place. Benin now is what used to be Dahomey uh, in, in West Africa. And so what we're talking about really is now part of the, the country of Nigeria. So the arts uh, of the kingdom of, of Benin, uh, they, they developed really advanced artistic culture. And a lot of Europeans thought that the savages in Africa could never have done something of this quality on their own. So the hypotheses were was were space aliens that came down and taught them how to do this. Uh, was it Egyptians? Uh, was it Portuguese? Or so on. And the bottom line is that, that they did this themselves. themselves. Uh, the artifacts, the term uh, Bernine, I'll come to this in a minute, but the artifacts uh, are in bronze, ivory, uh, and iron. Uh, the bronze pieces were created using the lost, the lost wax method of casting. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, there were bronze wall plaques, life-size bronze heads depicting the Obas and the Iobas. The Iobas are the, the queen mother, that is the mother of the Oba. Uh, and in addition to the, to the plaques, which to me are one of my favorite things anywhere, uh, there were other animal and human figures uh, as well as items like ceremonial belts. Uh, ivory was used, uh, carved into masks, ornate boxes, combs, and, and amulets, armlets, uh, and tusks were maintained uh, in the hole and carved uh, very extensively. Well, even the bronze pieces probably aren't really bronze. And if you know anything about metallurgy, you know that it's really difficult to look at this object and say whether it's brass or bronze. Uh, and so the, most people now 
believe that the majority of pieces uh, are in fact uh, made out of brass, uh, which is an alloy of copper and zinc, uh, as opposed to bronze, uh, which is an alloy of, of copper uh, and tin. But without doing metallurgic analysis, you, you really can't tell that. But the, the generic term then uh, is bronzes. The, the lost wax casting technique uh, is, is, is really interesting. I haven't got time to talk that much about it. But basically what you do is you build a figure out of clay, uh, cover it with wax, put a, another coating of clay around it, uh, and then melt the wax out uh, and pour metal into the mold. So it's a one-shot thing. If you blow it, uh, that has to be, it has to be recast. Uh, and so this just shows you a, a, an ingot or a, a pot of hot metal copper being poured into, uh, poured into a, a mold. So this, I've used this term benin bronzes, uh, and basically the, that this term is used for a group of thousands of objects that were taken from Benin, which as I pointed out was now in part of Nigeria in 1897. The exact number of pieces is unknown, but it exceeds 3,000. Uh, not all the works are made of bronze. Uh, they include figurines, sculptures of, of Bunyan's rulers, elephant tusks, and ivory masks. Uh, they were looted by British troops, sold in London, and now are dispersed around the world. The, the bulk of the items are now in museums in Europe, particularly uh, London and the British Museum, the Ethnographic Museum, which is in Berlin, uh, and the Ethnographic Museum in Vienna. Uh, there are four pieces in the sand, part of Cap the Catherine White collection uh, that the Sam has, and I, I would really like to know more of the backstory of how a woman from Cleveland's, probably the greatest collection of, of African art in the United States, uh, ended up here in the, in the Sam. Because it's an incredible collection of art. So, this is plundered art, or looted art, depending on how you, you like to use the term. Uh, in 1897, uh, Captain James Phillips, uh, a British explorer, uh, visited the Kingdom of Benin. He was initially welcomed by the Oba, that is the, the ruler, uh, but then he was told, now is not a good time to come to Benin City, uh, because we're celebrating major religious festivals, uh, and so don't come. Well, Phillips went against the Oba's wishes, uh, and uh, he and several of the members of his party, uh, <laughs> that is, members of his mission, which are the white guys, uh, along with probably 200 African porters were killed. Uh, they were attacked on the way to Benin City, um, and in retaliation, the British government sent troops in to decimate the Opus Palace, steal artifacts in the kingdom, uh, and then upon return to England, some of the items were placed on loan to the British Museum, uh, while many more uh, were, were sold. Uh, newspaper headlines, uh, the Benin disaster, probable plans of a punitive expedition, I interview with one of the people who was there, uh, another subsequent little bit later uh, newspaper headline uh, we're there and we're killing people so this is referred to as the British punitive expedition of 1897 theoretically the move was to in retaliation for the murder of, of Phillips who went there if you look at it in historical context, this is one of a number of quote-unquote small wars that the British carried out in Africa in the 1800s. So it can be looked at really more, as a, rather than a punitive expedition, it can be looked at as part of the expansion of, of the British Empire uh, through the subjugation of peoples uh, in, in the African continent. So they got there. Uh, this is, this is referred to as the juju altar. Juju is a derogatory term for spirits. It's used in, in um, 
by the British and referring to these, these primitive folks uh, in, in Africa. Uh, if you see that wall behind, that's where a number of the, the, the bronzes uh, were found. Uh, so they got there, and they tore things up. Uh, these are some members of the, of the uh, punitive expedition. And what you see here on the, on the ground, uh, the, the major things are, are, are wall plaques uh, from, the, from the palace. And here you see a few more of our hero, British heroes uh, with the elephant tusks. Uh, this is, is a leopard, that's the Oba symbol, but all these are elephant tusks, stool, figurines, uh, and then uh, other figures along here, figurines here. But literally thousands of pounds of elephant tusks. Some engraved and, and others not, or carved and, and others not. Uh, I mentioned the, one of the Oba's responsibilities was to maintain shrines to the ancestors. This is an ancestral shrine. I want to point out a couple of things here. These are the heads of Oba's, and I'll show you those in just a minute, uh, a couple of other examples. But these are elephant tusks. And so basically the heads were used to support elephant tusks uh, on, these, on these altars. Uh, these are bells, figurines here. Uh, but it, interesting, uh, the, the use of the heads as part of this ancestor, uh, shrine to the Opus ancestors. Uh, so these are some of the, these are characteristic figures in a wall plaque. Uh, and uh, they're incredible. I, I've seen the ones in the British Museum. I also saw the ones which are, are now not on display in the Ethnographic Museum. The Ethnographic Museum used to be in a, a suburb of Berlin called Dahlem, uh, and they're, they're amazing. But here they are displayed in the British Museum. There's 65 of them on this wall, uh, and you can get an idea of the size. And I want to just look give you some idea of what these are like just by a few examples. So here are a couple of plaques. These are all cast bronze or cast brass uh, using that lost wax technique. But look at the detail. You know, these, these are our warriors. Uh, this one shows uh, the, the figure on, the, on your right uh, is the Oba uh, supported by, by two of these courtiers, uh, soldiers on the, on the left. Uh, another couple of examples, this is a warrior, an evil warrior on, the, on your left and on the right. It's a Portuguese soldier. So these show both natives, they show all kinds of various animals and so on. But one of the things that's interesting about this is in addition to the Portuguese soldier, you see these those are what are called manilas. And manilas were currency that we used to purchase slaves. They were made in Germany or England, uh, shipped by the ton uh, to, in the Portuguese ships, and then used in exchange. And after the Portuguese contact, many of the, the bronze plaques were in fact made out of these manilas which had been used to purchase slaves. Mm -hmm. Slavery was indigenous to West Africa. Not the trade in slaves to others, but these, these were slave-holding populations. And so they expanded their use of, of capture of slaves and, and developed a market for them. And the, as I say, the thing that's interesting here is that these are, as I say, they're manilas, uh, they're, they're bracelet size, uh, probably about three inches across, about this big. Uh, and I had a whole bunch of them that I don't have anymore, but they're an interesting story. Uh, these are our warriors. Uh, and you can see this is a ceremonial sword. All of these guys carry the ceremonial sword. Uh, it's called the Aba, uh, and it was an important part of their of their war for culture. These are examples of Oba heads. Uh, 
these are, are two different heads. I'm, one's in uh, Vienna, and I'm not sure what the other, where the other one is. Uh, another kind of head, these are wooden heads, but they were, at the time they were made, uh, covered with metal. And so you can see here, you can see here part of the metal on this, and this is, this is where rivets would have been, or screws would have been used to hold the metal onto the, uh, onto the head itself. Another example, this is a cast bronze head. This is a cast bronze head uh, of a Eoba. Uh, this is the, the, the Queen Mother, uh, and there are a number of different styles of these. Perhaps some of the most significant of the pieces from Benin uh, are the ivory Ioba masks uh, carved of the Queen Mother. There are either five or six of these known, and you see different different counts. There's one in the American Museum of Natural History, and the one on your right uh, is in CLR Museum. This piece were to come on the market would be high seven digits, high millions of dollars. Some of the overheads, the cast larger hat, cast heads, of which there are quite a few. Uh, the last time I know one was sold was a million and a half dollars. So this this ivory piece that's sitting down in the Seattle Art Museum is well worth over a million dollars. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the um, the intrinsic value of some of these pieces. Okay, so Benin, now part of Nigeria, they want their stuff back. It should, they want it to be repatriated, they want the bronzes returned, uh, and the question is, uh, will it happen? Well, it's happening. This is one of the first pieces that was repatriated. This is out of a museum in the UK. Uh, Heinemann Museum. Uh, this is a statue of a cockerel, uh, and it went back. Uh, these pieces from Germany have gone back. I mentioned the Ethnographic Museum, but it was originally Dolph moved into, um, if you've been to Berlin Museum Island, the Ethnographic Museum now is on Museum Island Humboldt Foundation. The bronzes have gone there, but they will not be displayed. So the question is, if they're not displayed, how many will go back? And these are some of the pieces that were repatriated. This, this, there you see in the inset in the bottom, uh, the, the Humboldt, or the Ethnographic Museum. Uh, so this figurine went back, uh, head went back, and several of the plaques. These pieces went back from Germany, including one of the ivory masks. Well, how about the pieces in America? Uh, it's being proposed that they should be repatriated. Uh, you can see here there are three of the ivory masks, the number of figurines, the plaques, the heads, uh, and so on. Uh, the, the French have taken quite a proactive role uh, in returning their, their, their bronzes. Uh, there is a, a new, well, relatively new, there used to be a, call, a museum called the Musée de Homme. Uh, and now there's a new, uh, very large ethnographic museum. Uh, and they are not displaying the pieces that they have. Uh, and this is a statement from the French government saying, while returning the objects removed from the continent during colonial rule cannot reverse or even come close to compensating for their initial taking or for the gross violence of colonization more broadly, to continue housing these artifacts in the gilded halls of places like the Louvre and the Musée du Quai Barlet uh, would be to disregard their functional importance as physical bearers of history for millions of contemporary Af Africans. But really no argument is as important as a simple fact that these cultural objects belong to the African communities they originated from. And that's the position of the French government. 
So I'll close with this. This is the piece that went back uh, to Nigeria. Uh, and here's somebody who's appreciating the fact that this magnificent piece of art um, was what we would call a piece of art, uh, a, a major cultural artifact of their society, uh, has been returned. And with that, I'll close and see if there's any questions. Would you turn on the lights? Questions or comments? Karen's the, Karen's the microphone person today. I will give it to Lord. Gene asked the question about the Rosetta Stone. The Egyptian government wants the Rosetta Stone back. Uh, that's. Uh, Henry and Carol. The Rosetta Stone is in the British Museum. The question was how about the, how about the Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone was. Uh, taken by Napoleon's troops in the early 1800s when they took over Egypt. Uh, then the, the Brits beat the French and they got the Rosetta Stone uh, and it is now the British Museum. And the British Museum will never give it back. It, it doesn't have this quite as questionable provenance uh, as the Elgin Marbles. Other questions? Yeah, Henry? Uh, I understand correctly that it's the government of Nigeria, the government of Nigeria that wants to repatri repatriate it, right? Nothing right. to do with today's Benin or Benin, no. which was, used to be the holy... Uh, yeah, it's, sorry, I should make that clear. It's the government of Nigeria yeah. that wants the pieces re uh, repatriated. So right. Benin is a company, it used to be a French colony, and it's just west of Nigeria. Yeah, Dahomey was, was part of yeah. Francophone in France, right? It was a French colony. There are also German colonies uh, in Germany, or in, in Africa. Cameroon, for example, was German. Yeah, Al. Considering, is this working? Yeah, considering the uh, Elgin marbles, uh, apparently Elgin himself was just originally going to cast many of these things. Wouldn't it be smart to cast them now and keep replicas? That's yeah. The question is, he was he was initially going to take casts of things, then he decided the real thing was much better than a cast. The British Museum has in fact offered to provide casts of them uh, to Athens, and Athens says no. We want the real thing. <laughs> yeah, Carolyn. Carolyn. Yes. Um. This is wonderful pictures. I enjoyed everything that you put up there. I was a little bit. <clears throat> confused about the size of some of the heads that you were showing. Um, I'm not sure if they're very large. The, the, sorry, the, the heads themselves are life size. They're life size. The, the Iola heads, like the, the Queen, well, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The, um, the, 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 the Iola heads are life size. Uh, the plaques, probably about 12 by 12 by 8, 12 by 10 inches. That. Okay, and the other part of my question is, I wasn't quite sure what your reasoning was for, you said you at first you, just, you thought that they should stay where they are so that the, the world can see them, or, and then you said you the, changed your mind. The Elgin marbles? Any of these. I, I think there's, a, the Elgin marbles particularly, I think once you look at the history behind them, they were, they were really stolen. Uh, there's a question whether or not the firm that he says he had was the salt never signed, uh, and I think it's it's very questionable. The, the difference between Benin and and the Elgin, Mar Elgin marbles is that the Elgin marbles came from Greece. They came from the Greek people who are there now. The pieces from Benin. Nigeria is a very heterogeneous place, uh, and so it's they don't really uh, necessarily go back. The old there's now a new Oba, yeah, in in this part of Nigeria, uh, but the I guess I, I'm a little more hesitant. Well, let's put it this way. I don't think that the Benin bronzes have. The, the worldwide cultural significance uh, that the Elgin Marbles do. And I don't think they are as closely tied to one society uh, as, the, as the, the Elgin Marbles. That may be a waffling. I may change my mind on that. 
But I, 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 the chances of somebody seeing something in Berlin or Vienna uh, is much better than in Lagos. And that may be a, a weak argument, but I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. I was, I was visiting the Forbidden City in China in the 1980s, and the guide who was showing us around some of the rooms said, they used to have furniture. They said, if you want to see the furniture, you should go to the British Museum. <laughs> yeah, you know, the British Museum's pretty cool. <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of stuff that the Brits took from a lot of places that's there. And the, the, other, the other side of this is I didn't get into anything, and I might do this if I do do a talk on indigenous arts, uh, stuff that Captain Cook took back, for example, and, and yeah. ethnographic materials like that. It's a, to me, it's a little less clear-cut than an invasion taking things. Uh, and as I said, I may come around on the on the Benin bronzes as well. Somebody else, yeah. Uh, supposing that uh, these artifacts had been sold by a government uh, several hundred years ago, and now they want them back because uh, they relate so much uh, to the culture of that country. Does that uh, change the situation? Yeah, I think if they, I think if. If Elgin had really had the permission that he said he had to take them, that would be a different story. I think, however, that he did not have that permission, uh, that he that it was clearly stretched, that he had the permission to do it. If the governments had sold them, that's a whole different story. And I think that's one of the things that you'll run into uh, when you start talking about repatriation of, of Native American art. If I can hold on just to ask a second Absolutely. question. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, early on that uh, you're a collector and uh, uh, you did not talk about uh, uh, the role of this vast market that goes on around the world uh, for uh, uh, artifacts from, from different cultures yeah. and I, I wonder if you had a comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I could, I'd be glad to comment on that. Uh, that's been clearly the problem with classical art, classical pieces from Italy. Uh, the, the market for pieces that have been robbed from tombs uh, is, is incredible. Uh, I mentioned the market. Uh, some of the Benin bronzes were brought back by foot soldiers, basically. They remained in their possession, they remained in their family's possession, they were passed down. You've got good provenance, and they've been sold on the open market. A couple, one I mentioned a guy that was a million and a half dollars. Uh, those were found, were brought back by by soldiers. Uh, there is an incredible market, uh, and these, un unlike uh, trying to sell the pieces that were stolen out of the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, these are things that can be sold because there's a, the, there's a little better provenance, uh, but your your the but the value of these is driven by the world market. So you get excellent point. Thanks. Yeah. Well, has there ever been a proposal for an international museum that could be located anywhere? Gibraltar, Madagascar, <laughs> Antarctica, the Canary Islands. Not in here. Yeah. That, would, that would accommodate uh, a lot of these things uh, properly attributed to the cultures that uh, gave rise to them. I, I think a lot of the encyclopedic museums try to take to try to take that position as a world museum to, to set up another one outside of any of the major countries that have collections now. Uh, as far as I know, has never been discussed. Uh, Why not? <laughs> Well, I guess I would say, why should you? I mean, is, is Greece going to be any happier if the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon sculptures uh, go to an island museum in Mauritius uh, or Dubai? If there were multinational pressures to do that. The, the international pressures are, are tending to focus on the issues of looting. And there's a lot of there's a lot of international pressure. There are international regulations about about the sale of looted art. I don't think my I don't think there's any way 
that you would get any kind of an international consensus that that's a good idea. I mean, I, you know, I, maybe, maybe you as a, as a stupid uh, person could do a better job than I can, but I don't, I don't think there's any way. Because the, the issues of e e even dealing uh, with the repatriation of Ludinar, uh, there's an incredible history of, of, the, of the, the things that end up in museums in this country, where they came from, and the provenances that are, in, that are imagined and so on. So, Don? Yeah, the, the question of Elgin art is much simpler, but uh, if something were taken from, F, from Ephesus, it would go back to a, a culture that has no relationship to that a previous culture. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, the, one of the arguments about, about the Benin art uh, is, the argument is, if these were made with money that was used to purchase slaves, why should they go back to the people who sold the slaves? Well, I mean, there's, it, I, I'm not saying I agree with that, uh, but, but that, but that's one of the arguments. I mean, both of these topics have been extensively written about, uh, and it's 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 fascinating. Yeah. Yes, Jerry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's it. Another example of stolen art is when you go to Korea. Their palaces are absolutely empty, and apparently all of the contents are in Japan or the United States. Soldiers taking things back. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of... I think, I think there are now laws against soldiers stealing things, <laughs> but in the past, that was, routine, that was a routine practice. Yeah, but your point's well taken. But, you know, the, 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 the conquerors both don't, not only write the history, but they take the stuff. Yeah, Jerry? So I, I was going to ask about the, the, just the concept of ownership. Does, uh, are the Elgin marbles owned by someone? Yeah, they're owned by the British Museum. Uh, they but, bought them. And how do they track back their... They, Ownership. Oh, they, well, I, I, El, Elgin got them in Athens, shipped them to Malta. They went from Malta to London, uh, and they were sold in the British Museum. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that's the short story. <laughs> uh, Priscilla, have your hand up. Okay. Alan and Priscilla. <laughs> oh, wait, yeah, shifting uh, to uh, Native American art. You know, we have so messed up most of those cultures, it's kind of hard to figure out where to repatriate the things. Well, I'll leave that for another day. <laughs> I mean, the real question, I mean, the, the best example of that uh, is not really art, but a skeleton that was found in, in Eastern Washington, the Kennewick Man. Uh, and the question is, first of all, was it Native American, uh, as represented by current Native American tribes, and if so, uh, who, who, what tribe did you belong to? And so who do you repatriate it to? And that's, you know, art's, art's simple compared to the Kennewick man. So nobody sees it now. It's locked up. It's in a vault. Well, as you say, it's all complicated. Uh, I spent some time in Utah, and pot hunting was one of the avocations for weekends. A lot of the uh, ancient sites hadn't been professionally excavated yet, and so it was sort of open season, even though there were laws against. So, as you say, it's complicated. Well, I, I grew up in eastern Washington, uh, and you excavated barrel mounds. You excavated Indian barrel mounds. I mean, that's, that's just the way people did things. Archaeology was basically uh, a way of getting good stuff. Yeah? Excuse me. I wanted to bring up uh, uh, national laws now against exporting cultural items. I know the, uh, the British. Would you like to turn that on? <coughs> I know that us, that I know that in Britain and Russia are the two I have personal experience with. Both have laws against exporting cultural right. items, right. which is like a Johnny Come Lately protection for. It's yeah. yeah I mean. Uh, 
a lot of countries have that, and the question is how you define something of historical or cultural significance. Uh, getting things out of Uzbekistan, for example, now uh, is is very difficult. I may have told it, I think I told the story when I talked about Uzbekistan that I bought uh, a large number of coins, uh, and when I left the country, they went through all the coins, found one that was over 50 years old, and confiscated it. Uh, many countries have export re regulations. Uh, Azerbaijan, uh, to export a rug, you have to have uh, a certificate from a museum. So that's, that's very common now. Uh, but there's also this huge underground market. Uh, and that, that, that's particularly important with the stuff that's looted from tombs. And, and most, you know, the, the, the most egregious examples of that are Italy and Egypt, uh, where you have tomb robbers. And this, there's a, there is a market, as Don says, there's a market for those things. Is there any obligation when something is returned to have it returned to its natural state? I assume that uh, that when these things uh, are, if they are returned, they'll just be displayed in uh, in a museum in the native country, uh, not returned, say, to uh, uh, a tomb uh, yeah. where they were taken from in the first place. Yeah, I think your your point's well taken. If, if the Elgin marbles go back to Athens, I can assure you they will not be reinserted in the Parthenon. <laughs> they will go into the Acropolis Museum, which is at the, on the bottom of the Acropolis Hill. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank